All right, this time we are talking about stimulus fatigue and its relationship or the relationship of those two concepts to the number of reps in reserve that you leave in every single working set. So first part is to define reps in reserve. The acronym is RIR. You might've seen this a whole bunch on social media. RIR means reps in reserve. It's how many reps you have left at the end of every single set that you do. So for example, if gun to your head, you could have done 12 reps on the squat and you stopped at nine reps on purpose, then you technically had three reps in reserve. If you stopped at 10 reps, you have two reps in reserve and so on and so forth. So we generally in training talk about how many reps in reserve we have as a form of relative intensity. How hard did you try relative to what you could have done in the absolute sense? So here's the deal. How does RAR correspond to stimulus, rather to muscle growth in this hypertrophy context? Here's the deal. Like quite a bit of research to say that yes, you can grow muscle if you stop at more than five reps away from failure. So for example, if you could do something for 15 total reps, but you stop at nine or 10 reps, can you grow muscle? Yes, but it is wildly far away from what is optimal per set. So if you stop at five reps or more away from failure, you're getting really, really not impressive muscle growth relative to what you could. On the other hand, if you stop at zero reps in reserve, that is go all the way to failure or even go into negative reps in reserve, which means somebody spotting you, for example, and they help you grind out a couple of reps beyond failure, you probably grow the most muscle per set in that fashion. So if you had one set on a Monday to grow as much muscle as you could, to stimulate as much muscle growth as you could, and someone said, hey, Ellie, how many reps are you gonna stop at? The answer is, get me a spotter so that I don't have to stop and I can keep cranking until I'm barely moving. For one set, that's gonna cause the most growth, and it's probably a roughly linear relationship for causing growth uh, from five RAR all the way up to zero and negative RAR. So the fewer reps in reserve you leave, right about linearly the more muscle stimulus or muscle growth stimulus that you have. Remember that linear term because it's gonna come in handy right after this. All right, so that's how muscle growth works. The closer we are to failure, right, the more muscle will grow per unit set, per unit workout, so on and so forth. Okay, fine. Now what about fatigue? Okay, because muscle growth is a big part of the picture, but fatigue is another part of the picture. It turns out that stopping five reps or more short of failure is very low in fatigue. But think about it, that's more or less a warm-up set. It, it hardly fatigues you at all. Problem is, of course, it hardly grows you at all, which we'll get to in just a bit. Now, zero reps in reserve, going all the way to muscular failure, and negative reps in reserve, you know, having someone help you with two extra reps at the end when you can't lift them yourself, that is much more fatiguing than you would expect. In fact, it is exponentially more fatiguing than the amount of growth we get from it. So as you go from five reps in reserve to zero reps in reserve, your growth goes up like this in a straight line. If you track fatigue from five reps in reserve all the way to say zero or negative two reps, the fatigue goes up like that. It's an exponential curve, which means that Yes, it probably is worth going closer to failure to chase growth, but we really have to be mindful of that fatigue. The way we're mindful of it is to create the stimulus to fatigue ratio concept. The amount of muscle growth is in the numerator. The amount of fatigue caused is in the denominator. We divide the two by each other. The ultimate exercise, the ultimate set, the ultimate program has as much stimulus as possible with as little fatigue as possible at the highest stimulus to fatigue ratio. Why? If you have a higher stimulus to fatigue ratio, think about it this way, in any workout, any week, in any month, you have a certain sum total of fatigue you can accumulate beyond which it's over your maximum recoverable volume and you can no longer sustain a program. So you have a fatigue allotment, so to speak. If you have a really high stimulus to fatigue ratio training that you're doing, it fills that fatigue allotment with more stimulus, which means for any given unit of time that you're training your hardest, you get the most muscle growth. Point number two, another benefit of high stimulus to fatigue ratio training is any one session, if you have a high stimulus but low level of fatigue, you grow a lot of muscle, but the fatigue doesn't accumulate as much going from session to session and week to week to week. If you have a lot of fatigue in a session, the fatigue accumulation gets really crazy because your body can never really drop all the fatigue it, it takes in in one week. It takes it over to the next week and the next week and the next week. 
If you have a lot of fatigue, you quickly, within a period of maybe two or three weeks, get to your maximum fatigue levels and you have to deload, you have to take a break, and you have to recycle your training. But if you have accumulated very low amounts of fatigue, but still gotten a lot of muscle growth, you can train for four, five, six weeks productively growing the entire time. So we want the best stimulus to fatigue ratio possible. But notice, we have really crappy stimulus uh, and, but no fatigue at the very low, or, or sorry, very high RIRs, RIR5 or RIR4. But when we get really close to failure, even beyond, while the muscle growth is linearly good, right, a little better than it was at three or four RIR, the fatigue is extremely high, completely unsustainable, thus the stimulus to fatigue ratio is really poor. So if we take, if we have to take the best stimulus to fatigue ratio, of all of that, right, we can exclude the really easy training because the stimulus isn't high enough. We can exclude the very hard training because the fatigue is just crazy excessive and the higher stimulus just doesn't make up for it. We're left with our best guess is that something at like two reps in reserve probably on average has the highest stimulus to fatigue ratio. So if so someone says, hey, listen, gun to your head, <laughs> again, second time in this video, right? Gun to your head, you gotta pick a training intensity, a relative intensity, an RIR, that gets you your best average results. Right around two RIR is probably a really, really good bet, right? Because it grows a lot of muscle growth, not the most, but it generates way less fatigue than zero RIR or beyond failure training, and thus is much more sustainable, and thus will lead you to more growth on the net balance, right? However, if you're just starting a program, you have a new combination of exercise and rep ranges, it's actually not as hard to stimulate muscle growth, so you get really, really robust gains and maybe better stimulus to fatigue ratios at something like three or four reps in reserve. And on the other hand, when you reach the end of a program right before the deload, I mean, at the deload, you drop so much fatigue that like the week or two before, it's kind of like, who cares how, how much fatigue you accumulate anyway, you're gonna be dropping it anyway, so you might as well go for the maximum growth. Like the last session of your training before a deload, you stop at, you know, four sets of deadlifts and two RIR, someone's like, why didn't you go all the way to failure? You'd be like, well, I'm saving myself. You say, saving yourself for what? You're like, well, I don't know, it's a deal next week. So there is no point. So there is a good argument where we're really close to failure in the last week or two of training, right? So we take all that together, we basically have a design for a mesocycle which says we should probably begin most of our hypertrophy mesocycles at oh, three or four reps in reserve and then end them, so it lower our reps in reserve as we progressively challenge our systems, and the mesocycle at, you know, close to failure, maybe a little bit shy for something like a deadlift and squat where it's too dangerous to go to failure, maybe even beyond failure for something like a cable curl where someone could help us on the concentric, right around failure in the last microcycle, and then our it gives give us a great progression, and our average, if you've noticed, is right around that 2RIR, which is probably pretty close to optimal. This way we're safe, it's effective, and we get our best long-term results. Folks, if you like these videos, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, check out all the links we've posted for you in the description. And if you want more information on this exact topic, look for the scientific principles of hypertrophy training due out at some point in 2020.